Good evening. It's wonderful to see you all again, uh, most especially the students from uh, university and high school. And uh, delighted to have back, the last time some of you may have seen Yon, it was uh, during COVID. We had to do a, a webinar version. It's much better to have you back in person. Um, I feel you know, fortunate, uh, kind of as a friend and, and through the council. Now, I think we know each other about 10 years. You're one of the world's foremost experts on the cartels and, and, and sadly the narco violence that goes along with it uh, in Mexico, but you've also covered Central America, you've covered Brazil, gangs in uh, Jamaica. Um, we will get to Yon's book in a little bit later, Blood Gun Money, about the, the flow of, of, of huge number of weapons flowing from the United States into Mexico. But just because it's so much in the news lately, I just want to look a little bit more at the fentanyl crisis. And maybe, can you just people kind of know just some of the basics and why it is um, kind of in recent years, a lot of the cartels in Mexico have taken a shift away from almost what we'd call plant-based you know, narcotics, you know, the, the huge fields of marijuana or opium fields uh, or coca leaves, you know, that could be, you know, need large amounts of space to be grown to synthetic drugs. A lot of ways are much more deadly, much more, uh, you know, lethal. Uh, such as fentanyl and, and other you know, synthetic opioids. What exactly is fentanyl? How is it created? And why is it so, I suppose, attractive to the cartels? And why is it so concerning to everyone you know, beyond the cartels in Mexico and the United States? Yeah, thank you very much. And um, yeah, it's always great to be here again. I've got, got a, lot, a good uh, relationship with Houston going back some years. I worked for the Houston Chronicle uh, back in 2004, 2005 from Mexico as a, as a freelancer, as a, as a super stringer, they called it back then. Um, and yeah, my, my fourth event with uh, Ronan, he always takes me to good uh, barbecue and, and uh, Cajun food. So I've always had fond memories of Houston. Um, so uh, I would say what we've seen and what we're witnessing now in our lives is a revolution in terms of the illegal drugs. Um, this move um, from the plant-based drugs, so we had you know, marijuana going back uh, for a lot of years, a lot of decades, and then cocaine, which is still a chemical process, but cocaine, where you have the coca leaves and then you get the cocaine, and heroin, which is, you know, you have the opium poppies and then make the heroin. And then we've seen now this revolution to drugs made from synthetic chemicals. I need to talk more to chemists about this. If there's any chemists there, um, at the end, please come forward. I'd love to talk to you about, about the, the chemical processes. Um, what you know, we've seen in, in Mexico, uh, this is really when there was a kind of a groundbreaking thing that happened. Or one of the pioneers was going back to 2007. Uh, you had a, a Chinese uh, pharmaceutical importer called Chen Li Yigong, and he was Chinese uh, by birth, naturalized Mexican, and he set up the links between Mexican drug cartels and Chinese pharmaceutical companies. And he would, in his case, it was for crystal meth, methamphetamine, before fentanyl. Um, he would bring in the precursors, including various things, uh, various different types of, of chemicals, um, and sell them to Mexican drug cartels, who then cooked them up into crystal meth. And he was making so much money he had in his home in Mexico City, a mansion in Mexico City, $207 million in cash. When it was bust, there was a big question of where is this guy? It turned out he was like all people with lots of money, he was in Las Vegas. <laughs> he was going up there. He was going up to Las Vegas with spending more than $100 million in cash in casinos. Going into Vegas with suitcases full of money and spending all his money he's making from this uh, uh, crystal meth. Um, the casinos and were paying him back some of the money, so he was l uh, laundering the money effectively through the casinos. He also bought one uh, casino croupier, one woman who was running card tables. He bought her a million dollar house. Uh, and uh, he um, eventually, some of the casinos had to pay some of that money back. So anyway, this guy, he was eventually arrested. He's now in, in prison in Mexico. He, he was a kind of pioneer of this. Um, and then you saw it gradually, so kind of gradually building up and then moving as well from crystal meth as well to the fentanyl. So crystals, crystal meth is like a synthetic drug which replaces the cocaine high in a way. It's a stimulant. And now, it's only quite recently that the tables have turned so you have more crystal meth being seized on the southern border than you have cocaine. 
You've also now got more fentanyl than heroin. Now, fentanyl is a synthetic drug which originally was made by a pharmaceutical company and patented, um, you know, going back to the 1950s, which is a form of opioid. So opioids are synthetic formulas which, which imitate the opiates. And opiates are from der derivatives of the opium poppy, meaning they're painkillers, meaning they're downers, meaning they make people feel good, they make people feel... Get rid of pain, and often for a lot of people, it's both physical pain and mental and emotional pain. The stuff is so much stronger, uh, and it's been a real game changer in that, I mean, they, they people talk about being 40 times stronger, 50 times stronger. The level of overdose deaths, because it's so potent, you know, it's gone off the chart. I mean, we see 107,000 overdose deaths in the United States in 2021. 70,000 of those they had, fentanyl is at least one drug in the system. So that's, that, that is incredible. And it's a huge increase. And this is not at all normal levels. Now, why do the cartels do this? And money is, is, is the obvious thing. When you were dealing with plant-based drugs, you had to rely on crops. So you had a bunch of people growing opium, growing coca leaves and growing marijuana. They could be sprayed, they could be seized by the military, they could, you know, affected by the harvests, you know, by the temperatures. You had to wait for them. They had to bring that stuff down and process it. So cocaine was the biggest money maker. But cocaine, you could buy a kilo of cocaine for $2,000 in Colombia, pressed up, and sell it for like $15,000 in Mexico and $30,000 over the border and, you know, $100,000 when it gets to towns. But this fentanyl, you know, you can produce this for, you know, very small amounts and make, you know, you can produce a small amount for a few thousand dollars that's worth 500,000, 800,000, a million dollars. So, and the size of this, as well as a game changer, I mean, marijuana, you know, the old, you know, the old school dog marijuana, you'd have these big seasons of marijuana, fits in a football stadium. You know, these huge amounts of marijuana fits in a football stadium. Then you have these big seasons of cocaine, kind of fits in a room, you know, these big bricks of cocaine. But now fentanyl, you could have fentanyl in one of these glasses and that's enough to kill, you know, half of Houston. So it, it is, um, <laughs> some of the hype about this is true. Um, it's a very venomous drug and we've got a revolu we've had a revolution in terms of drug production, drug trafficking and drug use because of that. And it puts, you know, a very, very difficult situation. Um, and just to, to stay with the production of it, in, largely in Mexico, most of it's in Mexico. Um, in, in recent years, under some pressure, the Chinese have put in some regulations to try and restrict the exportation of some of these precursor chemicals, but a lot of people in the United States say it's not enough. Um, also, U.S.-Chinese relations now are probably the worst they've been since perhaps maybe the 1960s. Um, so there's the challenge of, of when does that flow of precursor chemicals, easy flow from China, stop? And maybe the even scarier thought, maybe you could talk about, you've written how some of the cartels themselves are saying, well, let's cut out paying the Chinese, the middlemen, we're gonna hire our own chemists, we'll make it in Mexico, or, or, or also what percentage of fentanyl is made in the United States itself, do you think? Right, yeah, so, so first about uh, with China, and, I, and I'm not familiar with, with, the, with the inner workings of China and, and the CCP and so forth. Um, what we, we, we saw this from pressure from the United States. So now, does so anyone knows how many types of fentanyl there are? Any, anyone guess how many types of fentanyl there are? Any guesses? Well, more than a thousand types. So first of all, um, there was like some pressure on China, they banned certain formulas. So in China, these same um, labs just made other, other formulas. Eventually, under more pressure, they said, okay, we're banning all fentanyl formulas. Any, in any of these things we can send a fentanyl, we, we, we can stop. However, it, it appears that, that not only are pharmaceuticals still coming out of China, they're also coming out of India and from Chinese organizations making fentanyl in India and other Asian countries. Now, 
a lot of this stuff now, as well as that, you have precursors. So you have precursors, which can, with some cases, these are not illegal. Now, it's very hard to see this. When you actually, again, that's why I don't need to talk to more chemists now uh, to be qualified to try and, try, and, try and make sense of a lot of this stuff. You get these new precursors all the time, new formulas find, find out. So you've got some weird, just basically list of numbers and letters trying to make sense of. Now, a lot of this stuff comes over in ships over the Pacific and into the Mexican port of Manzanillo on the Pacific coast. Even if, say, even if the customs people were honest, it'd be kind of hard to stop because you've got fentanyl, you have a false bill of lading, you, you, go, you go through this, 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 you know, you can hide it and so forth. It's like, what are you really looking for? How many do you search? However, there is big corruption. And I talked to uh, somebody with a lot of experience working in the port who told me there's intermediaries there, you can pay them $40,000 and your container goes through. And they have three million containers a year going through that port. So they bring them in, they can either fentanyl or precursors, make this in Mexico, and then take it over the border to the United States. You know, you've got huge seizures and the seizures they are finding are, are off the chart. I talked to one, this is going some years ago, I talked to one guy uh, who was uh, in prison in the United States in North Carolina for flying cocaine. He flew, he used to fly cocaine back in the day, he was flying cocaine straight over the border from uh, Mexico to the United States under the radar with the lights off. But then he started just flying cocaine from Venezuela and Colombia to Mexico and it would be going over the border. He was in prison in the United States and I asked him how much of the drugs that are seized, how much is out there? And he said it's about four to one, meaning for every ton of cocaine they seize, there's four tons on the street or four tons that are getting through. So all the fentanyl they're finding out there, there's like four times as much still, still going through. Um, uh, now, there's also, you know, like, uh, this was according to a, uh, a DA agent, he was saying, you know, he had information or, uh, the, and this is, a, all this story's been around as well, that in Mexico there, there's cartels who want qualified chemists um, to work for them to, to find better formulas. So then you can even take this stage back. And that's why so I need to take, talk to chemists to understand like, what does it mean if you take the precursors and you start making your own precursors and you're making these from very much base chemicals and very much stuff that's inside the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical industry, you know, it's very, very hard to keep uh, an eye on that. Now, in the United States, there is fentanyl taken, imported directly into the United States as well. It seems, it's difficult, it's impossible to know exactly when you've got these clandestine industries, but the evidence seems to point from what I'm seeing that much more is coming through Mexico right now than is going directly into the United States or being synthesized in the United States. Um, because of the quantities, the pure quantities, just look at the numbers you're seeing on the southern border of fentanyl seizures there. And, you know, as you mentioned, it's it's catastrophic in, in recent years, the number of overdose deaths in the United States has basically quadrupled, um, you know, 70,000 just fentanyl alone. Um, do you see any kind of correlations or maybe kind of unfortunate distinctions between, say, what we call the, the crack epidemic of the 1980s and 90s that disproportionately affected a lot of times urban African Americans uh, in you know, a lot of our big cities as, and, and then it was labeled and treated as a crime problem as opposed to now, maybe we've progressed as a country, uh, the fentanyl crisis and other opioids have disproportionately affected more white and often rural or Midwestern uh, uh, you know, uh, users, um, addicts, and maybe it's seen more as a public health issue. Um, do you think there are some disparities there or maybe overall we should be happy that we're hopefully trying to treat this more as a, uh, an issue of addiction as opposed to at least the lower levels of crime. Yeah, what a comparison, thinking back to uh, 19, you know, 1980s and Ronald Reagan and uh, Motley Crue <laughs> and uh, all of those great 80s things, Ghostbusters and Back to the Future. Um, I mean, a very, very different world, isn't it? Um, if, if you look at the crack epidemic, I think it's an interesting point of comparison. There's so many different things. You look at the crack epidemic, um, and I mean, I just, you know, I looked at some of these numbers before I came out, uh, Ronan sent me some of the questions, and, and I, you know, I've been looking at this, but like in 1988, kind of the height of the crack epidemic, 
The overdose deaths in the United States, 5,000, lo- less than 5,000. 2021, 107,000. So a very, very different scale. Now, there's more to it than that. You know, a drug addiction doesn't only hurt with drug deaths. You have, you know, addiction which can damage families and, you know, people are not, you know, all these kind of things. A lot of the, in the crack years, the crack epidemic, there were a lot of the, the deaths and the violence and the horror was people shooting and fighting over the profits of this on the corner. You had a lot of crack being sold, a lot of uh, people got crews on the corner selling crack and a lot of money and then people fighting. So you had very, very high murder rates in certain cities in the United States in the 1980s. Fast forward to now, um, and say we see it as a health problem, I, I think the United States ha- has not grasped or really got a clear policy on it in some ways. Uh, I mean, on one side, you have certain elements of the Republican Party um, who are saying, you know, we need to, you know, take out the cartels and call them terrorists and, and, and kind of bomb Mexico and so forth. Now, I think they're wrong in thinking you, this is some like quick fix. You could just do this. You could just like uh, do a Sicario style operation, the movie Sicario, kind of go over the border and just kind of bomb these things because I've been covering these cartels for the last 20 years and you've got like hundreds of thousands of people involved in this. Um, you're not gonna just like bomb it away, going over. But I think it's a fair point, and, and also apart from the fact you know, you're violating Mexican sovereignty and you know, it comes into a very, very big dispute. But on the other side, they are making a point, this is a real issue, it's a real political issue. Um, now, on the, again, on the, the broad elements of, of, of the, the democratic side, You've got you know, people saying, oh, we, we've got to look to more, towards, more towards health or whatever, harm reduction, but not really a clear policy, again, of what that is. Um, I mean, really, how do you um, ha- have much better treatment? Because yeah, you shouldn't, it should not be acceptable having 107,000 people dying of overdose. There's you know, a lot of young people, a lot of people in the prime of their lives. Um, so in a sense, you could say, well, if, if you know, this is affecting uh, middle America in some ways. And it's also right now, the United States is not really handling it in the same way. Now the crack epidemic, just I mean, there's a kind of last uh, note on that. Um, in some ways, there was more elements of kind of media hype around the crack epidemic. Sometimes there was overly hyped about this whole thing. Stories like crack babies, which were not really true. You know, uh, you know these kind of babies born on crack and stuff, which are kind of not really true. and. Uh, and um, there was kind of a lot of, there was certainly a lot of very aggressive kind of hardcore policing, putting a lot of people in prison over that. Um, uh, but, um, but yeah, different world now and, and certainly not a kind of clear solution or, or really necessarily treating it number one priority. And, and at the end, we'll, we'll turn to kind of some, you know, Policy ideas, and there are no easy there are no easy answers. Obviously, you know it's, it's kind of like foreign policy, but at least you have a selection of, of bad choices. Um, this is an enormous market. Uh, it's estimates of Rand Corporation 150 billion dollars annually at the United States that Americans spend on illegal drugs. That creates all kinds of disproportionate uh, in terms of of, of of every various sectors of Mexican society, you know, economics, in terms of those willing to resort to violence, maybe just for two or three examples, could you talk about I think what's reflective of the corruption, the difficulties at the highest levels, um, first about the um, capture and eventual release of El Chapo's son, and then in terms of sadly the the levels of corruption going to the very top, um, the former Secretary of Public Security, which would be the equivalent roughly of United States Secretary of Homeland, uh, 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 sorry, uh, the Homeland Defense, um, uh, Luna Garcia, or even their Secretary of Defense, uh, Cienfuegos, both being um, accused and uh, in corruption and bribery. Can you talk about how it has gotten such incredible levels all across the board of politics in Mexico? Yeah, absolutely. So who here's heard of El, El Chapo? His hand. 
It's, fu- it's funny, isn't it? I mean, I, and I said it's not a joke. El Chapo's got a higher re- name recognition probably now than any president of Latin America. You know, you know it's how famous, uh, uh, even within Latin America itself as well. Um, I, w- I went to some of El Chapo's trial in, in New York and saw him first hand a few feet away. Uh, it was kind of a mix of kind of seeing all this violence, but also kind of this kind of certain awestruck seeing the figure um, a few feet away in the courtroom. Um, now, I don't know if anyone heard of El Chapo. I mean, anyone's, how many of you are familiar with, with his sons? The various sons they call Los Chapitos, <laughs> the little Chapos. Um, and he's got a whole bunch of sons, but four particularly uh, are considered the head of the kind of new faction of the Sinaloa cartel, the cartel is from Los Chapitos. And they got really big into fentanyl. They were some of the ones who really saw this, uh, profits of this. Um, they run um, a pretty hard cartel in Sinaloa. been spending a lot of time in Sinaloa um, the last couple of years. Um, you can see the difference. Um, the kind of uh, gangster control in the city of, of Culiacan and around Sinaloa. They have a scorpion, one of their symbols uh, they use. And they had, um, back in 2019, just before the pandemic, all those, it seems like years and years ago, um, they had one of, the, one of the sons, Obidio Guzman, known as El Raton, or the mouse. Um, they captured him in a house, and they had about 100 police and soldiers captured him. And in response, 350 gunmen took to the streets very, very quick, sorry, 700 to 800 gunmen took to the streets very quickly responding to the police and soldiers. Um, the, the army put out another, another 250 gunmen, 350 gunmen from the, from the army. The police melted away. There was a massive gunfight in the city. People were terrified. If they were taking their kids, uh, to, if they were picking up their kids from school, they would hide in the schools. And this big gunfight ensued for about four hours. The cartel gunmen even went to the barracks where the soldiers were and where the wives and family, wives and children were and threatened them. And after four hours, the government released Obidio Guzman. So he's released. So a real stain on, on the president of Mexico. Now this January, right before Obrador, the president of Mexico was due to meet Biden, they did a second operation and they got Obidio Guzman. Very, very timely for this international meeting. This time, they didn't go in with 350 soldiers, they went in with three and a half thousand soldiers. They went in, they had him, they found him in a village called Jesus Maria. Funnily enough, there's a song, they have a thing called Narco Corridos, which are drug ballads. And there's one about Obidio Guzman, and it actually mentioned the name of the village in the song. So it's like, everyone's like, where did they get the intelligence from? You know, the, 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 the DEA, the CIA, you know, it was in the song mentions that he's there. But they, they went in there, 3,000 soldiers, they carried out a massacre, killed, killed a lot of people in this village. But they got him back, got him very, very fast to the airport, put him on a plane. Now, it was in the commercial airport, the planes came under fire from the cartel gunmen. And there's video of people in these commercial planes ducking because these bullets are right, coming. But they flew him back and they, they caught him. So that gave the Mexican president something to, to bring forward to, to this meeting. Um, however, Despite that, there's a lot of tension right now between Mexico and the United States. Um, in the US, and you talk to a lot of the, the drug agents, DA agents, a lot of the officials in Washington, they're like angry about this. The, the level of fentanyl they're finding this year on the borders even more than last year. It might, you know, we're only in April, not even in May yet, and already the numbers are looking to beat last year's numbers of fentanyl on the border. So. The US is like, a lot of, they're like angry now, and what they did was they, they created, this, they brought this big indictment again against the other chapitos. They said, we, and they said we infiltrated them for the last year and a half. We, got, we had paid informants inside their organization. And the Mexican president responded, kind of offended, how come the Americans are infiltrating a cartel? That's violating our sovereignty. You know, we have to defend you know, this thing. So it's a tense moment right now. Um, and I would say it's a difficult moment. Um, we have to be careful where this goes. I mean, they need to, we need to you know, have a US, Mexico City and Washington working together on these problems, mutual problems. Um, but be careful, this could kind of spiral a bit out of control. 
and, and just related to that, uh, you mentioned it earlier, uh, you know, there's been discussion on both sides, the American Republicans, of, of maybe finally designating the Gulf Cartel or other cartels as what we call an FTO, a foreign terrorist organization, uh, because that, that adds a degree of weight and substance to it, especially for charging people for, especially financial related crimes, or even if they're not directly related to a murder, um, it's easier to uh, prosecute people and give them longer sentences if, if they can make a terrorist connection. But can you talk about the, I suppose, flip side of that? You touched upon it. Um, President Lopez Obrador, AMLO in Mexico, already upset with the United States and saying, you're violating our sovereignty. If we push that too far, is he going to stop cooperating on immigration? And they have actually, he's been quite helpful in immigration uh, for both Trump and Biden and keeping especially Central Americans, uh, you know, on the Mexican side of the border. Where do you think that goes? And, and if U.S. does designate a cartel or two as a foreign terrorist organization, the equivalent of Al Qaeda or ISIS or Al Shabaab, uh, where might things go? Yeah, this, this might well be coming. Um, I, you know, they, they do commit sometimes acts of terror. Um, some of you might be familiar when, when they massacred nine uh, women and children uh, from a Mormon, cross-border Mormon community in Sonora in 2019, um, burning down a casino um, in, in Monterrey, um, killing dozens of people, throwing grenades into places, um, and, and killing regular people just, just celebrating. So there are, there are acts, I mean, just, just a, 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 the Saturday before last, they went into a, um, a swimming pool, an open swimming pool in the state of Guanajuato and carried out a massacre killing a seven-year-old boy. Um, so they do in some ways commit acts of terror. The thing about designating terrorist organizations, so the, I mean, this, this goes a lot of ways. Um, you know, on one side, they feel that it would be easier. They wouldn't have to go through these really long indictments. They just kind of grab people. It means they could use this in pretty aggressive ways, but maybe also kind of grab people who are only kind of tangent, tangentially connected and sort of like trumping up these charges or putting very, very hard charges on them. It would um, go ways they might not expect right away, some of the people pushing for this. One of them is the people selling in the United States who sell guns, which we'll get into. Um, they could then be done with terrorist charges, providing material for terrorist organizations. Um, and they're getting guns in Texas, in Arizona, and a bunch of places. The people who are f claiming asylum at the southern border, arriving and saying, I need asylum, if they say I'm fleeing from a terrorist organization, that would strengthen their asylum claims. So they can go different ways there. But like I think um, I mentioned earlier, one of the things is, is, is this, this idea that like um, you could declare them terrorist organizations, you're changing the name you call them, and you could do some cross-border, you know, you could justify that a drone attack. You say, well, we've located a uh, cartel training camp in, um, in Chihuahua, uh, and we fly some drones over and put some soldiers over and we, we blow it to hell, blow it to kingdom come, then that's not gonna solve the problem. And the idea you're gonna suddenly just by changing the name of this and by shooting a couple of people, you're not gonna solve this. This is a really, really big issue that needs big, comprehensive, long-term commitments and solutions to that. Um, but it could happen. Um, you know, it could happen in terms of that, and you know, we could see that arriving in, 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 in the near future. And you know, from the American perspective, obviously for, for years we've said, can't you get the cartels under control? You know, can't you do more to establish and, and maintain the rule of law? You know, and they'll argue whatever president is, you know, we're doing what we can, we're trying, and they'll say back, in a lot of ways, rightly so, to the United States, you have a $150 billion a year addiction problem that most of that direct violence, except for the overdoses, 90% of the people killed in the narco related violence are being killed in Mexico or maybe Central America. We pay the price for your addiction. And to make it even worse, and it's, it's, it's highlighted in your, your excellent, just eye-opening book, uh, you know, Blood Gun Money, um, you do almost nothing to stop the flow of weapons. Every advanced, you know, virtually militarily capable weapon, whereas an AR-15 or like a 50 caliber sniper rifle that people can just buy at a gun store in Texas or Georgia or, or, and flow across the border, 
what is the reality of, of the, the, the drugs flowing north we all know about, but we don't talk about the 200,000 weapons every single year that flow from the north across the border south into Mexico and what that does for these cycles of violence. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I was covering this violence for a lot of years. Um, I, I knew about the issue of guns, and I thought, well, what can we really say about this? Because, you know, in the United States, you have a Second Amendment, and you know, that's the way it is. But then, you know, it started to dawn on me when I did a, an interview in, in a prison in Ciudad Juarez in 2017 with a gun trafficker. And he described how he used to go, um, for he was in Juarez, he used to cross over into El Paso and drive every weekend to Dallas. Uh, and buy 12 to 15 a AR-15s, mostly, and drive them back into Mexico. And I, and I said, okay, what, you know, what did you use in terms of paperwork? And he said, no paper trail. There was no paper trail. So I thought, that's interesting. How come there's no paper trail? So no. And the way he described it was, he said, oh, there's a black market at the gun shows operating there, parallel to the regular gun show. So I went to check out his store and went up to uh, Mesquite, town of Mesquite on the edge of Dallas, uh, sometimes called the gun show capital of America, where they have gun shows uh, pretty much every weekend. And, and went around to check out his story and, and found a few people who said, no, you need a, a driver's license, you need paperwork. But then found some people who said, no, 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 no paperwork. We can sell you a gun with no paperwork. And the idea is you have the private collectors who are just selling a weapon to somebody. There's no paperwork involved. But they're not acting as simply collect private collectors. They're acting as gun salesmen engaging in the business without a license. And some of them are doing it with, a, there's people there and they said, we've got brand new AR-15s, haven't been fired, we'll sell them right to you. So they're people who are deliberately taking advantage of this and selling guns to people who don't have the paperwork to buy guns, who might have a felony offense, who, who might want to you know, smuggle for, for criminals and criminal networks and want no paper trail. And they're buying and selling and acting as straw buyers for them. So I realized, well, there's quite a lot to this, actually. It's not just a question of the Second Amendment. And you, know, you can be totally in favor of the Second Amendment and in favor of uh, people's right to bear arms, but think there's something a bit you know, off there that this is being abused and that people are able to arm these cartels so easily. So I spent four years uh, getting into this, you know, went down to... Uh, the gun factories, you know, right over in Romania where they make AK-47s uh, and around right in the business here, talk to the AR-15 owners of America and the head of the Alaska Machine Guns Association and a militia member in Michigan and carried on talking to gun traffickers and sicarios and people, you know, hitmen and people moving these, these guns around. Um, and you see, you know, this, as, as right I mentioned the figure, more than 200,000 firearms a year estimated going to Mexico. There's been, over the last 12 years, about 192,000 firearms, which they've definitively traced. They've captured from cartels and other criminals in Mexico and definitively traced them to, to factories or to shops here in the United States. And it's this, you know, ask this question, why, why is this not being stopped? What's stopping this kind of basic law enforcement in this issue? Uh, and I think, you know, there's, you know, this is something you can see quite clear. There's a lot of very difficult things. I think dealing with drug addiction is very difficult. And um, that's a hard thing to do, to try and deal with drug addiction. You know, you've got to get to why people become addicted to drugs, why they're taking fentanyl, heroin. But there's some basic stuff. I mean, you see cases, and there's a case where an American agent was killed in, in Mexico. And they traced the gun to uh, a pawn shop in Beaumont, Texas. And a guy had walked in there and he bought 10 AK-47s for the cartel. He was paid $600 plus the cost of the rifles. So he's consciously buying 10 AK-47s for, for a drug cartel. And this guy, his punishment when he was caught, probation. So there's this idea of like, you know, you're consciously buying weapons for a drug cartel and there's no consequences. So some basic law enforcement there, especially these big numbers, there was somebody who was watched and he was going around Phoenix, Arizona, buying guns for the cartel, spent half a million dollars buying guns, buying guns, buying guns. We have this issue of 50 caliber, you know, Barrett 50s, very popular with the cartels right now. There's video, when I mentioned that, when, they, when there were 700 gunmen on the street and they were fighting the soldiers, there's video of, them, video of them firing these 50 cals and one of these bullets blowing a soldier's leg off. 
So if you're a Mexican soldier or police officer, you're fighting these cartels and they're firing 50 calibers at you. They're buying those in stores in, in Arizona. You know, someone's $15,000 a pop, $10,000. So, you know, how come, you know, there's a basic thing, there's basic, I would say common sense measures that could be taken, a basic effort to try and stop this uh, southward flow of guns. And I would say it's in the interest of the United States not to have really violent cartels on the southern border. Because you get situations like some Americans who went to Matamoros, went crossed over Brownsville, went to Matamoros for a surgery, and then they got kidnapped, a couple of them got killed. You had situations like a, uh, some years ago, a woman who, crossed, uh, who was jet skiing with her husband in Falcon Lake. And they crossed over into Mexico and were hit by uh, these setters, and the, and the husband was killed. So having these heavily armed cartels is bad for American interests, kind of destabilizing Mexico, pushing refugees and so forth northward. And I say some basic measures could be taken just for a start. And I just want to ask you know, one last question, and then I'm going to turn over to the, the audience questions. Um, you've been covering this now for, for 20 years, um, you know, 50 years plus now of uh, you know, when Nixon first declared the war on drugs. In a lot of ways, it hasn't worked. Um, it's kind of failed. Um, some ways, I, I think of the violence that you've seen is really only comparable to kind of what Al Qaeda and ISIS did. You've been at horrific scenes I won't even describe, um, just things people should probably never see. Um, with the council, I've had the pleasure of interviewing from highest levels to just mid level officers to special operators, you know, for their, you know, SEALs or, or Deltas. Um, or the or people, intelligence officers who worked on the war on terror, and they would say, you know, for a certain point, we were, we're playing whack-a-mole, you know? Yes, we can take out, you know, this cell, we can take out, you know, this, you know, this leader here and there, but, but how do we kind of get to where we can stop this flow or, or blunt this ideology? Because it's not normal for, not normal for a 14-year-old boy in Pakistan to say I'll be a suicide bomber, or 14-year-old boy in Chihuahua to say I want to join you know, a cartel. What do you think are some viable kind of options policy-wise, um, especially say here in the United States and Mexico, you know, if you want to mention that as well, when especially now it's complicated the fact that as you mentioned, some of these synthetic drugs are so, so dangerous you can't just say legalize fentanyl or something like that. The first time you use it could kill you. Um, what are some viable, realistic options you think might be possible to kind of at least reduce the, the catastrophic kind of addiction here in the United States and, and the, the subsequent violence in Mexico? Yeah, sure. Um, well, three areas. So you mentioned 50 years since Richard Nixon called drugs public enemy number one. Um, uh, and we're at a place now with, you know, a very difficult place with, with drugs now, worse than ever, a lot, a lot worse than 50 years ago. But it's not an easy way out of it either. Either You, got, I mean, we, you know, we, we can say the war on drugs has failed, and in many ways, the government doesn't even really talk about the war on drugs anymore. It's kind of more of us critics who talk about it. But what do we do in its place? I mean, a survey I like to take in different audiences is just to kind of get a sense like, raise your hands if you're in favor of uh, legalizing marijuana or legal marijuana. Um, raise your hands. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm in favor. I'm just saying, just saying I'm getting a survey. Raise your hands who's in favor of legalizing cocaine. Yeah, small, small. I was, in, I was in California yesterday, and there was a lot of, you know. <laughs> uh, raise your hands if you're in favor of legalizing fentanyl. No takers. So, so it's a difficult situation, isn't it, in terms of what public opinion and in terms of what we really do. Um, I would say um, we could perhaps find, uh, I mean, start within drug policy of saying a middle way. I mean, I think, you know, you, you, legalizing marijuana now, we could say that's kind of crossed a threshold um, and maybe something should happen federally. But then what do you do with other drugs? And um, really focused big time work on reducing and working with addicts. I mean, I, say, I think it should be a, a really fun policy of that. Now, exactly what that means in terms of sometimes working with, with addicts, working with prevention, you know, a lot of resources into that. Um, in, in terms of, in, in Mexico, I mean, there's two things. One is how do you build police forces that work? Um, and it's 
very hard. I mean, I can tell a lot of horror stories about police officers working with cartels. Um, I, was, I was in a, a, a small town in Sonora. There was a police officer. Not only was he driving cocaine around in his police car to different points, he had two rifles. He had a, poli he had a, 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 a police issued rifle and a cartel issued rifle with the Punisher sprayed on the side of the gun. Um, so how do you, you turn those police to police that work? But I think building police forces, real police forces in Mexico has to be something. This has to be seen as a long-term solution. And the third is finding real solutions for the young people, the young children who are trained to be the next generation of hitmen. You know, there's you know the, the social work, the work of prevention of them becoming the next killers carrying on these crimes. Um, I'll just combine a few questions because uh, they're in the same, uh, you know, basic perspectives. On, to get your your opinions on fentanyl. Um, uh, Richard asks, instead of killing their customers, why don't the cartels use less fentanyl uh, or reduce its potency? Um, and then kind of related to that, Jessica asks, how do you tell uh, that a fentanyl pill is lethal if there are a thousand different kinds? And then um, Nelson asks, um, can you discuss the legal medical usage of fentanyl, I suppose, originally? Yeah, very good question. So yeah, all about fentanyl. Um, take them in reverse. So, um, you know, fentanyl is an, is an effective painkiller. Um, that's what, you know, a lot of, you know, morphine, um, God's own medicine, you know, they, they, they're called, um, you know, morphine. There's a, there's a story going back that when they, when during World War II, um, the, the US government had its source of opium poppies cut off and it needed morphine for the troops. So it went down to Mexico to Sinaloa and actually started dealing with the, with the, the, the growers there to bring in to make morphine back then. Um, you know, these are effective painkillers. Um, uh, there's all different levels and all different types of, say, different opioids. Um, but that's what the, you know, people want some of it and use some of it in medicine. How can you tell the doses? So this is, gets into, I mean, not only the different types, but the different strengths. Um, so you could, you know, you, you find one pill, you know, is it going to have, you know, one milligram or 10 milligrams? And maybe one milligram you can survive okay and 10 milligrams will kill you. There's a, a very, there's a controversial uh, idea is that people say, well, we should allow testing sites. So that if a, you know, somebody's buying drugs or whatever off the street, they can go and test it and they can say, oh, this has got this amount of fentanyl, this strength, uh, and it will kill you, it won't kill you. And they're controversial because some people say, well, you're encouraging people to, to take the drugs. Um, in terms of an interesting, good question from, from Richard. Um, yeah, why do the cartels sell drugs that are killing their customer base? And it's a good question. I ask myself this: Why are they doing this? Um, you kill a, you kill seventy thousand, you know, kill a hundred thousand people in a year. That's a hundred thousand customers you've killed off. Um, and I think it shows that a lot of this is not long-term strategic thinking. <laughs> it is short-term profits. It's like. You know, we'll make this right now. I mean, it's. I spent I spent a lot of time talking to, to drug traffickers. Uh, I've talked to some who are in prison right now, some who have, you know, one guy I've talked to um, in some deep conversations who just served 17 years. He was going to serve uh, 38 years, but he had his sentence reduced because of a, of a change in the law. And he was describing his life as a drug trafficker at a high level, and give me some insight to how they think. Um, it's a different world. I think a lot of them are, are, are really living in a very violent, dangerous world, also drunk on the money and the power. Um, so you talk about what it feels like for them, it's, it's, it's money, it's power, and they're living a very violent situation, and they're thinking short term. Um, I can bring in these chemicals, I can make these drugs, I can sell them and I'm making myself $20 million. And they're not necessarily thinking, you know, these drugs kill off my customers and what am I gonna do next year? 
Now, you do wonder, and we're going to find this out. It is really brutal uh, to, to say we're going to find this out. How much this level of death will reduce the demand for drugs in the United States? But I say this is tragic. I mean, look at the streets of San Francisco, Los Angeles. People there, uh, I mean, this is a lot of people hurting. A lot of people taking these drugs. And a lot of them are going to die. Um, just but some of you have come, this is the third or fourth time I think we've, we've, we've hosted you once was virtual, glad to have you back in person. Um, you're an incredibly brave and courageous journalist. Um, different people have similar questions. Um, you know, one asks, um, journalists have been assassinated in Mexico, do you fear for your life? Um, and TD asks, a, you know, a similar question, you know, as a journalist, how do you how do you protect yourselves? Just for context, in the last 20 years, 150 journalists have been killed in Mexico, uh, one of the worst places for journalists in the whole world. Um, how do you keep doing what you're doing, and is there a line you have to kind of walk up to and, and hope you don't cross, and, and you may not know you, you crossed it? Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, there's been more than 150 journalists murdered in Mexico since 2000, the time I've been there. Um, some of them have been my friends. Um, one particularly prolific journalist was Javier Valdez, a very good journalist and writer from the state of Sinaloa, who wrote eight books, um, very good uh, poetic writer, um, was shot dead on May, uh, May 15th, 2017, with uh, 12 bullets as he was going for lunch from his office. Um, there's one thing about to understand a little bit about the murder of Mexican journalists. It happens, Mexico's a big country. And, and again, I'll be careful when I give these talks or go on TV and write stories to give you a certain nuance. I don't want to terrify all of you to not go to Mexico. Um, Mexico's a big country with very different levels of violence around the country. Mexico City, as I wrote a story about recently, has got less murders per capita than Houston, Texas. And less right now than Portland, Oregon, which had a spike in murders. Um, Yucatan, the state of Yucatan, um, has the same murder rate as Belgium. However, you've got places like Zacatecas, um, which is, you know, has the, the, the most murderous cities in the world. So it's very varied across the country. Where the worst attacks on journalists are happening are these towns and cities where you have these, a lot of violence happening, a lot of cartels are very, very strong. So one thing is for me to, to go from Mexico City and also from other colleagues of mine from Mexico City, Mexican colleagues from Mexico City, to go uh, to Michoacan, um, to interview a drug trafficker, and then to leave and go back home. If you live there, and you, if you're a drug trafficker, or you're at a crime scene, you might be at a crime scene, there's a dead body on the ground, there's some drug trafficker there on the phone plotting revenge, and I've been in that situation, and then you go to the supermarket or to the cinema and you see that same guy. So you're living around this, and they know where, who you are, where you live, and so they're, they're living under very um, you know, horrific situations where they're basically you know, dictated to by the cartels. Saying that, um, we can never be um, too confident about this. There's been you know, very many situations which have been hairy situations over the years. Um, there's also been a lot of Americans and, and other people who've just simply been killed for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. There was uh, an American school teacher who was doing a lot of kind of what I do, going to parties, hanging around, asking, kind of living this world in these areas. And they accused him of being a DEA agent, uh, and he was murdered in Chihuahua. Um, another uh, young uh, American-Canadian who was going through Mexico on a motorcycle um, and was murdered. His mother came down to search for him. So there's been these situations. Um, as a journalist, it's a lot of protocol, a lot of experience, um, a lot of different techniques. <clears throat> um, sometimes, you know, from everything from asking local police for protection in certain places where you have to call them up. One time we were being pursued on a road um, with guys following us. We had to pull in and call up a contact in the local police to come out and give us some protection. 
even though the police can be working for the cartels, still they can be, you know, add, add protection to you. Sometimes from that, from working with local people to dealing with, asking permission to go places, um, and um, when dealing with the cartel people themselves, having, you know, a certain attitude, um, and constantly thinking about this, constantly thinking, revisiting, how you gonna, how you gonna do this, how you gonna make the best of this situation. But it's always a concern and always something that we can think about. Um, and just I want to end on, on two great questions from students. Um, one kind of maybe what, what can happen in Mexico, and then the other kind of what can happen in the United States. Um, Bethany, a, a high school student at Audi International School, asks, uh, you mentioned the cartels were re recruiting young, young teens you know, off of the streets. Would educating these teens for specific jobs, trade schools, um, lower the amount of children being recruited? Uh, and, and just in more generally, you know, what can the Mexican government do to, to reduce the influence of the cartels? And then on, on the U.S. side, uh, an interesting question, uh, Olivia, a student at Sam Houston State University asks, um, uh, is it in the United States' best interest to give the crisis the same media attention as we did in the 80s with the, you know, the crack epidemic, or are we creating mass hysteria kind of that's counterproductive? And, and you know, maybe how should we frame the, the, you know, what's going on now with the fentanyl crisis? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll answer those questions in, in reverse as well. Um, so in terms of how the media should cover this, I mean, it's always challenging. And I, I, as a journalist, I think in some ways you don't get to decide exactly how the media coverage is going to be. As a journalist, you just go and write your stories. You know, you go and write your stories. Um, You've got to make judgments and say, I think, you know, as journalists, we do need to have a responsibility and see this, you know, this story is hype. We shouldn't be covering certain stories, but certain stories we should be. And I believe this is a story that does deserve big media coverage. Now, you can't decide as an individual journalist all the time, is this going to be in the front page? You're going to be, you know, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. It's like, you know, uh, news days, there's a lot of things happening. Other news days, nothing's happening. But I think this is something that we should cover, and the violence in Mexico is something we should cover, the drug overdose we should cover. We do have to be careful sensationalizing it um, with the violence. Um, it, it's how much you show the violence graphically. In Mexico, they have a lot of these um, newspapers um, where they show a lot of very graphic violence on the cover. They call it La Nota Roja, like the red news. And traditionally, there's been a lot of appetite for that. In, in, in the United States, a lot less so. Uh, when I used to work for the Houston Chronicle, um, remember the, uh, the journalist had some covered, uh, these, these uh, people, Americans being killed in Saudi Arabia uh, some years ago. And there was a photograph then, and, and readers complained, you know, you, you shouldn't be showing you know, photographs of dead bodies. Um, but either way, how graphic you show, you know, violence does need to be covered. Um, and we need you know, to give it as much perspective as we can. Um, but this is an important, I think, I think when you've got human life, when you've got life and death, um, and people dying in the prime of their lives from murder or from drug overdoses, it deserves coverage. Um, last uh, question, and it's been a, been a you know, great, uh, it's always great to be here again in, in, uh, in Houston and with the World Affairs Council. Um, like solutions in terms of, you know, the. The, the future for Mexico and the United States. Um, is, I always like to end on a positive note, and, and I said some bad things about a lot of people dying of overdose and so forth. Um, I think you're gonna have to see a future that's different in, on both sides of the border with these issues. Um, if it's, you know, right now, um, Mex people in Mexico dying from bullets and people in the United States dying of overdoses, um, there's got to be less in the future of this. Uh, it's got to happen sometime. Um, so how do you, I need to say deep problems of society. Um, going to the US side first, um, it's got to find ways of dealing with this. Again, the addiction problem, the drug problem, the use, the demand, um, why is it um, that there's people that, you know, it can be a lot of things, broken families, um, lack of faith, broken communities, um, lack of economic possibilities for certain people. All things, um, 
you know, victims of abuse. But why, you know, are these people in a better treatment of people to not even get to the stage of taking the drugs? Um, uh, and a future where you don't have these numbers. There's other things as well. There has to be an element of law enforcement. And you, know, you can try and reduce the amount of the very venomous drugs on the street. But then there has to be a side of that treatment. In Mexico, um, uh, Bethany correctly mentioned um, you know, finding better ways. I spent a lot of time interviewing some of these hitmen. And the thing about some of these hitmen is you talk to them and I ask them about their, go through their life story and go through like when they got in recruited by organized crime. Some of them had very, very brutal childhoods. They're recruited. Um, I talked to a guy who recruited to hitmen. He was saying they looked for the kids who had hate in their hearts. And they describe taking life and doing evil things, but also they got a lot of pain in their own heart. They're both victim, victimizers and victims to an extent. And I think Bethany right, you know, correctly points out, you offer people better options in life, better economic options, but also it's, it's basic reaching out. And sometimes you see these communities where there's no paved roads, where there's a real kind of failure of the government to reach out to these places, of society to reach out. And it's not even just about the money, but it's about the kind of the effort and the inclusion in, in, the, in these people. So I think, um, um, you know, those things, there is hope there. And I see things have to change sometime on this issue. So... Uh, yeah, I'll leave with a positive note there, and, and thanks very much. Like, not, a, not an easy thing to do. Uh, and again, I just want to say, we, we have uh, Johan's excellent book, Blood, Gun, Money, at, at the back of the room. I'm also volunteering him to hang around and sign copies for all of you who want to get it. I know some of you already have it. Um, and, and honestly, uh, you're one of the most courageous journalists I know, um, covering incredibly difficult, you know, uh, basically waves of violence in Mexico, Central America, and beyond. Uh, I just want to thank you for coming to Houston again, and, and most importantly, thank you for, for what you do to kind of help the world know what the reality of, of cartel violence is. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you. Thank you.